All right, here we go. All right. When I was a young boy, I mean, I'm pretty young still, but when I was younger than now, like really, really young, I remember a time when I was sitting on the toilet and I was trying to do number two, trying to do the big one, poo-poo. And as I was trying to do that, my mom was by my side because uh, I was so young and she was coaching me. I don't know if they do that in other cultures, but I know in the Korean culture, it's a very common thing. When you're very, very young and you're learning to potty train, right? So you're sitting there. Mom's on the side. She's coaching. Go, oh, push, <laughs> push, right? I don't know if you remember that, guys. And I remember at that moment, as I was holding on to some toilet paper, I said to my mom, Mom, one day, one day, Mom, I'm going to make so much money that you're going to wipe your butt with it. That's what I said to my mom. I said, I'm going to make so much money that you're going to wipe your butt with it. Now, I don't know exactly what was going on in my mom's mind and in her heart when I said that. But at that moment, I think my mom was really, really touched. <laughs> she was so moved by what I said. And so she says to me, this is what she said, Oh, Daniel, you can't even poop on your own. <laughs> Listen, I don't need your money, she said. All I want from you is, and this is what she said, for you to be healthy, for you to be strong, for you to live a happy li life. And that's going to make me happy. And I thought that was just a bunch of poop. <laughs> But then I, now that I'm, an apparent, uh, I'm, I'm grown up and I'm a parent myself, I totally understand that, uh, what my mom was saying. And I think I told my mom that I would make so much money that she would wipe her butt with these dollar bills because I knew, to some degree, the sacrifices that my mom and my dad made to raise me and my brother. The struggles and the life that they were enduring and persevering as they were immigrants into a very foreign country. And as a young boy, I think I was just thankful. And, I, and I, wanted to, I wanted to give back. I wanted to do something for my parents, for what they did for me, and for what they're doing now, even. I thought it was a noble thought. I thought it would honor my parents. I thought it was a, a good thing. But even if it might have been noble and honorable and a good thing, honestly, I guess, well, no, I really think it wasn't meant for me. I can't afford my mom to wipe her butt with money. I mean, I wish I could still do that for my parents, for my mom and dad, but at the moment, as you can see, it doesn't look like it's going to be happening. All throughout my life, my mother often said to me, and this is so precious, I think, she says, don't think to try to give back to us. My mom and dad, that's what they would say to us. Don't think to try to give back to us, but give back to others with what you have received. Give back to those who are less fortunate with the blessings that you receive. Now, I don't think um, they knew, my parents knew that I was going to be a minister. Actually, they did not, not want me to be a minister. But it was very prophetic, right? And that's the kind of life that they, were, they, that they were training me to be, to be a minister, I guess. To give to others what I receive, right? The, 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 the blessing that I receive from the Lord, I want to give to you. Here in our passage here, I'm going to go right into it now. David is king over Israel. And after many moments of unrest, many times of battle and victories at war, finally the land was at rest. Verse 1 tells us that. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. Right, that's what it says. And so this is a rare moment. It was a time of peace and tranquility and at that time of rest, as he was living under the blessing of God, King David was, King David comes to some very, very big realization. He says to the prophet Nathan in verse 2, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. In other words, King David came to realize that, hey, I live in a palace. My God, the God that I serve lives in a tent made of cloth. And at this time, King David accumulated so much wealth. He was living in wealth and prosperity. Some scholars say that King David was worth a billion dollars at the time. And his house was built with cedar wood, which meant that it was the best material used to build a house. It wasn't some dinky old place. It was a palace, a mansion. While God, the one who made David, 
And David, David, made David to be who he is, right? That's God. Was building in a tent, covered in curtains. And David came to realize that. I don't know about you guys, but I can relate with David. I really can. My wife and I, my children, we live in a townhouse in the suburbs. Nice place. It's not a big place, but it's a nice place. It's a home provided by God's grace, I believe. But when I think about my parents' place, they live in Chicago right now. They live in a little one-bedroom elderly apartment. They're paying rent with their Social Security benefits. Honestly, it breaks my heart when I think about it. They deserve so much more for what they have done for me and my brother. They deserve so much more than that, right? And then, honestly, this is what David must have felt when he came to realize this. This is what David was thinking as he was struggling with while he was living in this great big mansion during a time of peace and rest. And I believe this is a very natural thing. If David never even thought of this, or if David thought that it was, that's just the way it is, God is just like that and taking him for granted, we would call him a spoiled brat, right? And so naturally, David comes up with an idea. Interestingly, in verse 2, David doesn't even mention that he wants to build God a house. He doesn't say that. All he says is, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Yet, in verse 3, if you look at verse 3, the prophet Nathan says to the king, he says, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Hmm. It's as if Nathan was reading David's heart. David never mentioned that he's going to build a house, right? Or maybe Nathan also thought the same thing that David was thinking, maybe. And so David's implication and Nathan's assumption tells us that this is a natural thing. It's a natural response. Or in other words, another way to put it, this has to be the right thing to do. David had the idea. And maybe David didn't know for sure if it was a good idea. And so he checks with his religious guy, with his pastor, with the spiritual leader, right? Nathan, the prophet. And he confirms it for David. And so we see that for David, this was a natural thing, his idea. It was the right thing to do. It was a good thing to do to make God a house. And it was backed up by the pastor, Nathan the prophet. And on top of all of that, I'm not sure if David knew this. I think he did. It's an assumption. I'm pretty sure Nathan knew for sure. But if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 12, which was a long time ago, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10 to 11, there the people of God were on their way to the promised land. Right now they're already in the promised land, obviously. And God says to them in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10 to 11, I want you to stay with me. He says, but when you go over to the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to, for, uh, to inherit, and when he gives you the rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your contributions that you present, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. God told his people that there will come a time, this is a long time ago, when they will enter into the promised land, and they did, right? And there God will choose a place to dwell, right? He also tells them that it's a time of peace, and they are. Now I'm pointing this out once again because for David at this time in our passage, while they were in the promised land and in a time of peace and rest, David got an idea, a grand idea, a huge idea to build God a house. And so for David, this was so natural, this was right, this is good, and it's backed up spiritually by his pastor. And on top of that, it's backed up biblically, as we just read Deuteronomy chapter 12. Now, if you were David, would you go for this idea? Would you go for it? Yeah, of course, right? What's stopping you? What more confirmation do you need? I just listed to you so many things of why he should do this. It's only natural for David to be thankful to the Lord. It's right, and it's good, it's spiritual, it's biblical, yet Yet, verse 4 and 4 to 7. Take a look at verse 4 to 7. That same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel... 
Did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? In other words, and this is important, I never said to you, and I never said to my people that I wanted a building. I never said to build a building for me. I said, instead, what I said is, to ju- the, said to the judges of Israel, feed my flock. That's what he's saying. Verse 7, I commanded them to shepherd my people. That's what he tells them. I never said, why have you not built me a house of cedar? In other words, brothers and sisters, we are not called to be builders of buildings You and I, we're called to be shepherds over sheep. Amen? I don't know if you really got that. Building me a house might be natural, God is saying. It might be a good thing. It might be a right thing. It could be spiritual and biblical. But it's not for you. It's not for me. Listen to what God says to David through Nathan, verse 8. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following sheep that you should be prince over my people Israel. In other words, listen, David, I called you when you were a shepherd. I chose you as a shepherd. I saw how you dealt with the sheep. I saw how you feed and care for the sheep. And that's what I called you to do. To be a shepherd over the sheep, to feed the flock, not to be a builder of buildings. Verse 9, and I have been with you wherever you went. And I've cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the names of the great ones of of the earth. Verse 10. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and I will plant them. So that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. Verse 11. From that time that I appointed judges over my people, over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. In other words, David, I have been with you. And I will continue to be with you, to continue to be with my people. But look at what the Lord says to David at the end of verse 11. What does he say at the very end? He says, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Right? It's weird. Did you get that? It's a twist in the story. The Lord will make you a house. David already has a house. It's a big one. That's why he felt guilty inside. Obviously, the Lord is not talking about the physical building, is he? He's talking about the inheritance of David. He's talking about his descendants, his offsprings, his future generations. The Lord says, I'm going to make you a house. Amen? I'm going to make you a house. Listen, brothers and sisters, I don't know if you, I don't think you got it. Listen, we could have great ideas, amazing thoughts, and pure intentions, and it could be seem natural, good, right, spiritual, even biblical, yet it could be wrong. It might not be right for you, right? You could come and talk with me about it, and as a pastor, I might even tell you what Nathan told him. Go and do all that is in your heart. You could find biblical support and spiritual confirmation, yet it might not be right for you or me. I mean, this is a great thing that you are trying to do for the Lord. It is. This is a great ministry that you might have in mind. This is a great mission that you might want to accomplish, but it might not be for you. For instance, Lord, I want to go to Ukraine right now to help all those persecuted families and children. Well, this is a good thing. It's right. It's natural. It's spiritual. It might even be biblical. And the Lord might say, what about the persecuted families here? Right? You don't have to go all the way over there to to serve them, do you? What about the families here in Philadelphia? Lord, I want to start this worldwide ministry of gospel preaching. I want to travel the world preaching to everyone and every nation, saving souls of hundreds and thousands. This is good. This is right. This is spiritual. It's true. It's biblical. And the Lord might say, what about your own family? Right? What about your own kids? Are you raising your kids according to the word? Lord, I want to plant. I want to plant church plant and create a thousand churches in ten years. This is good. Spiritual, biblical. And the Lord might say, what about your own church? Is your church doing well? Lord, I want to go do this and do that for you. I want to build your kingdom, God. And the Lord says, you want to build me a house? No, I will make you a house. I'm not saying that all those things that I just mentioned to you are are bad things. They're good things. I told you, they're good, they're right, they're spiritual, they're biblical. But what I believe the Lord is saying to you and I today is that we might have great plans and amazing ideas, but that might not be our calling. Rather, we should do the calling we have now. Whatever God has placed in you right now, faithfully as a dad, faithfully as a mom, faithfully as a wife and a husband, as a brother, as a sister, as a friend, as a pastor. 
The Lord says, you want to make me a house? No, I'm going to make you a house. And God continues to speak to David from verse 12 and on. And this is what we call the Davidic covenant. God's promise with David. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, in other words, when you're dead, David, I'm going to raise you up with offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I hope you're listening. Now right here, many people think what I just read to you, that God is talking about David's son, Solomon. I know probably majority of you right now is thinking that right now what I just read for you, that God is talking about Solomon. Many people think it's Solomon because he will be the one who will build the first temple for God. Right? He's the one who builds the temple for God. But the Lord isn't talking about Solomon. He's talking about the son of God, son of David. Who is that? Jesus Christ. He's talking about his everlasting kingdom. And he continues in verse 14. He says, which, which by the way, in verse 14, if you look at it, it's a, you can find verse 14 being used in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5, the New Testament. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5 is talking about Christ. Right? He's referring to Jesus. So, this is what he says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. He's talking about Jesus. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of man, with the stripes of the sons of man. Here the Lord says, when he commits iniquity. And this is where it gets confusing, right? Because wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. You keep saying that is, I keep saying that is Jesus, but how could Jesus commit iniquity? How could Jesus commit sin? He doesn't. He can't. And so the literal translation that I looked it up in, in the Hebrew is wrong. It's it's iniquity is committed upon him. That's what it means. When sin is burdened unto him. When he bears our iniquity. Amen. Do you see it? When he bears our iniquity. That's what it means. The Lord says, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. In other words, the cross. Verse 15 and 16, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, as I mentioned earlier, many people think that God is talking about Solomon, David's son. But it cannot be Solomon. Since after Solomon, the king of the kingdom of Israel split, it divided northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And his line will end when the Babylonians exile the people of Israel and Judah. But when David heard this promise, this covenant that God made with David, verse 18 tells us that David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you, might, that you have brought me this far? And he continues this prayer in praising the Lord, telling him that, that, that there is none like him and giving him glory. But what I found interesting here is that when David heard this promise, his response was he went in and sat down. Now, I don't know for sure if this is true. This is, this is an assumption. But from David's reaction, it seems like he was so blown away. I mean, you need to read the passage for yourself again. So mind blown. It seems that David is so overwhelmed. He says, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house? In other words, David thought he had a great plan. He had a great grand old plan for God. David thought his idea for building God a house, that there's going to be nothing greater than that. Yet when he heard as he's sitting there, or as he's standing there hearing God's covenant that he's promising David, God's plan for David's life and for David's family, he's blown away. It was so big. It was bigger than what he could imagine. And so there was nothing else he could do other than to just sit before the Lord. And just take it in, to bask it in, to soak it in, processing it. It says, there is none like you. There is no God besides you. Brothers and sisters, you and I, we might think that we have great plans and great ideas and awesome stuff. And they might be good and they might be right. True, faith, right? But when we are faithful with what the Lord has given us right now, whether you like it or not, whatever it might be, there is a greater blessing beyond what we can imagine that God has in store for us. We need to submit to his will with what he has given us today. The Lord says, you want to make me a house? No, I'm going to make you a house. The Lord never wanted 
a physical building for a house. Personally, I don't even think that the temple that Solomon built was something that the Lord ever wanted. We will get to that as we go on. (laughs) That sounds very controversial, and it is. But actually, if you go back to verse 6 and 7, the Lord says, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought, brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house in cedar? Here we see God telling David, I am a moving God. I don't stay still. In other words, I prefer a moving house. What is that, a mobile home? Or maybe, a, what do you call it, RV, right? A trailer house, a camping car, whatever you want to call it. So when God told David the promise of an eternal kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, he was telling David about his son, the son of David, Jesus Christ. As he said to David, you want to make me a house? I will make you a house. And so just as you and I know, When Christ came, he came to die for the sins of mankind. He came to die for your sins and my sins on the cross. But he didn't stay dead. On the third day, what happened? He rose from the grave. He resurrected. And then he ascended into heaven. On the 50th day, who did he send? He sent the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, and he sent the Holy Spirit where? In us. In us. And so the Bible tells us God lives in us. Not just Emmanuel, God with us. Yes, he is with us, but he lives in us. We are his house. We are not the physical building. We are a physical being. (laughs) We are constantly moving. We are God's trailer homes, amen? No wonder God said to David, you want to make me a house? No, no. I'm going to make you a house. Just like the wolf who said to the little red riding hood, I will have you for dinner. God says, I will make you a house. God has made you and me, us, a house for him. We are the house of God. It is not this building, although it's beautiful. It's not any place. We are the church. We are the house of God. Amen? And so the greatest plan, the most wonderful idea we could have is not building a building for the Lord. It's not trying to do great things for God, but to represent God faithfully, to shine the light of Christ, to be the salt and light, to love one another, that others may know that we are his disciples. We are his ambassadors. We are his letters. The Bible teaches us that we are like little Jesus. The world prays, the world may praise empire builders, skyscrapers. The world may lift up mega churches, big churches, and there might be people who are wiping their butts with dollar bills today. But that is not for me. That is not my goal. That is not my mission. Our mission is to be faithful witnesses, faithful testimonies to what Christ has done for you in your life, for what Christ has done for our families, for our children, our neighbors, our church. And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Just as the Lord promised David, I will make you a house. Amen? All right, brothers, let's pray.